There is inevitably going to be some overlap on a day like today um, in terms of some of the, the slides being used and, and some of the issues under discussion. To start with, the, what just want to recognize the sense of, in terms of the Fenland past, that really from the mid-19th century, if not earlier, there's the sense of, you know, we know it's a flatland, but it was long recognized that underneath it there was this dry and fruitful country, largely because of the tree species, but also the artifacts that were, were dug up. Now, some decades ago, I published a, a study which tried to look at the contrasting histories of the 19th century and the earlier 20th century. And it was just quite interesting that the way that in all the drainage histories that were officially done, they all took Roman prefiguration for their enterprise, the sense that drainage was an act of civilization, bringing agriculture into the region, so that they would see them cast themselves as Romans. And whereas, of course, if you, there's a large body of the folk tales that, uh, published by Porter and Bartlett, which then basically the locals take the role of wily ancient Britons it's casting themselves against the Romans. And it's all this idea of the wily Fenlander, um, which you know, is really one of the grand cliches of the region. Um, I think one of the things I basically want to do, it's not such a grand sense of overview, but really look at what degree of evidence there is for marshland usage in the area. Because the point is, it's fairly limited. Oh, so just a talk was mentioned, the thing about must farm. Um, we've been digging it now, we'll be digging it to the end of March. It is a gobsmackingly wonderful site. Um, best site I've ever seen in Britain, certainly. It is certainly, it's a late Bronze Age, essentially a platform. It's well worth visiting, and if not, it's got very good social media coverage. Because the point is, is the work at Must Farm is partially for what we expect Fenland archaeology to look at, like this perfectly preserved landscape that's reminiscent of, of Glastonbury. If you could see the slide properly, you see, for example, in this case, um, it's a pike jaw that's being held in the base. Now, this develops on work, the excavations there that were done in the same quarry five years ago. We excavated part of the river, and it's when we got this flotilla of, bro of Bronze Age log boats, but also the fishing weirs, eel traps, etc. So, that sense of fulfilling the picture of what we expect Fenland archaeology to be. But it is a very rare thing, and that's really the point, that it, part of it is that it is platformed on a river, and those are rare. And one of the things that will come out of the study is going to be this issue that do we think every Fenland river was like that in the past, or is it because of the specificity of, of the Fengate Basin? Because remember, Francis's work is showing that it's a, you know, we know it's a major developed area. It's got major metal work. It's probably uh, manufacturing Bronze Age swords there. So the argument is, that, is this there because it's a special place, or is this what we expect to see uniformly through the Fen? Right. Now, the first of our repeat slides <laughs> for the creation of the marsh. <laughs> um, and it's just to point out that in this, the, the thing is, it's about the rise of the sea levels, marine flooding coming in, backing up the river systems, creating the freshwater marsh. And it's on the lower left-hand side. In the early Bronze Age, you're seeing its maximization. So about 1800 BC, the sea is going as far, uh, as far as possible. And of course, it has a much larger, um, the berm of the terms of the, the marsh and the sea, because of course, it's essentially estuarine. Now, not to focus so much on the sense of the, the paleotopographic or the paleoenvironmental sequence, but it's important that we think about what the implications of it is. Because it's the loss of land, in this case, that's staggering. So this is highlighting the Ely, and, well, it's the Upper Delfts had them, but you can all recognize Ely, and the sense of the Ely Chatteris Peninsula. And over the course of prehistory, it's losing 75% of its land mass. And that's, you know, everything that implies in terms of how communities are living, changing, and adapting. Because it's also quite important we start thinking about what does that mean for people's ways of lives? How do they respond? Now, the normal model is to see it as a kind of, because it's both a, the sense of a steady state retreat. You know, people living in an area, they stay in an area, and as the waters get higher, they increasingly go up slope where it's drier, and so that animals, animals bunch and people bunch. Um, that tends to be the standard way of looking at it. I think one of the other factors we have to recognize is that sense 
are people necessarily like animals, or are they potentially <laughs> like birds? Could they jump landscape? You know, you've been living at the end of the Chatteris Peninsula, and for generations now, the water's getting rising and higher and higher. And eventually, you might well say to yourself, screw this, we're leaving this area, it's had it, we're going into, you know, I've heard of this really great place called Fengate, or this really great place called Over, and it has the potential to lead to bunching. And I think that's interesting for what its potential is, because I think there's quite a potentially very complex social dynamic going on in terms of how communities responded to this. Now, a nice example, just a, a very small example, of reactions to these rising marsh levels that we're getting um, is on these necklaces we've been finding. So this is the site at Long Stanton, out of the Fen, or the Fen hinterland, well away, well inland, equal distant from the River Ouse and the River Cam. Nice late Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age settlement full of pit wells. In fact, and there's Francis Pryor visiting the site. And one of the nice things is this case, we're getting a freshwater mussel shell necklace. You know, nice small thing, not the kind of thing that the world turns on. But in this case, it's also interesting that then up in the northern part of the Fen, where you start getting the whole thing about where the marine flooding is coming in, and you see a number of sites that are the ones marked in red up here in terms of the Middle Bronze Age, where we're getting evidence of salt production. Because it obviously becomes a big thing. It's a very important invention of the period of the Middle Bronze Age. It means every time you kill an animal, you don't have, it's not a feast, but you can store you, the meat for later on. The thing that's interesting, again, is this question of, so these, basically, the Fen Edge, certainly South, South Lincolnshire, the whole thorny <laughs> peninsula area, if they're not living at the seaside, they're living very close to the sense of the estuarine marshes. How rare the evidence is in terms of any kind of marine exploitation. I've evaluated it all, it's very, very, very rare. We've had this site up in South Lincolnshire, Langtoft, the one on here, where that you're actually, there we do get quite a lot of evidence of marine exploitation. We're getting dumps of seashell that has been exploited, sea mussel. Um, in the cremations that are contemporary with it, we're also getting uh, evidence of bird cockle shell. What that comes from is quite interesting, but it is interesting that it, it does, is in the cremations. The other thing that's very cool is that both at Langtoft and now also on this site at Pode Hall, which is on Thorny, we've got cockle shell necklaces. That's what's showing in the bottom. It's got a central whelk also. So it's a small thing, but it's the idea that people are wearing their environment. On the inland, you're getting freshwater mussel shell necklaces. On the, in the, out on the coast, you're getting these cockle shell. The thing that is nice is there's been a burial at Thorny of it's a food vessel burial, again, the same period, sort of 1900 BC. It's, it's too dark to see, but it's with a limpet. And that's very cool. It's, it's sort of a child's burial It's at the elbow. And limpets wouldn't be on the coast, of the West Fenland coast at that time, when, the, when you're at the seashore. It would be gravel and sand. You'd expect cockles, you'd expect whelks, but not limpets. The closest place you're going to find that is going to be Hunt Stanton. And that becomes a very interesting issue in terms of issues of identity of why somebody on the other side of the Fen would be taking a seashell, or if not more, from Hunt, this Hunt Stanton area. OK, now back to my stomping ground for the last 30 years, uh, which you've seen a bit of. So this, obviously, the end of the ooze washes. Um, for 30 years, the work's gone on here in very three major projects. Haddenham we'll talk a bit about. Cone Fen will end briefly on, and then there's the large quarry at Over, which you've, you've seen a slide of. Um, the one critical thing here is the Barrow Fields. Um, these are the Barrows, Bronze Age Barrow Cemeteries. The Neolithic burial, burial you saw here, there's three up here, and they're bordering the edge of the River Ouse. The big thing is the, the complexity of the Paleo Channel system, and this will be something we come back to. But this is, um, obviously, this is the result of the work in the quarry, the complexity here. The, uh, the outside of this area, the complexity of the Paleo Channel drainage hasn't been worked out yet because it hasn't had the body of research. But just quickly to look at the Haddenham area, because it's to see it locally, what does the loss of land mean? So basically, on these sequence of maps through from the, the Neolithic through Roman times, it's the available dry land that is in gray. And what you simply chart is that by the time you get to the Bronze Age, you can see the emergence of these, uh, the terraces as marsh-surrounded features with the Bronze Age round barrows on the top, 
The sea, effectively, the estuarine marshes would have been on the other side of the level at that time. And by the time you get to Ro the Roman period, everything, all the dry land has retreated back to the upper Delft's peninsula, in this case, the one bit of high land in that entire everything. Everything else has been lost. And that clearly had major implications for how people lived in the immediate area. Now, in terms of the Delfts itself, um, there's not time to go into its archaeology. It's dominated by this great Neolithic causeway enclosure. It's got a Middle Bronze Age field system. We'll just discuss briefly later that it's got a, a Roman shrine built on top of a Bronze Age round barrow in this case. But the thing is, the dotting around the outside are these Iron Age settlements. In this case, the middle later Iron Age from about 300 BC. Um, and they're very interesting because they're all situated the same place. They basically want to be at the fen edge at the time. They've got their water meadows in front of them, the marsh beyond that, and they're maximizing their agricultural potential on the top of the terrace because they're mixed farming communities. And that's the important thing. They're not, no one is an exclusive fen dweller. That just doesn't seem to exist in prehistory, at least as far as we can distinguish them. It's off of a mixed farming base. So just quickly to look at this site at Haddenham 5, because this we dug in the early 80s, you know, wonderfully preserved site, we don't need to go into it, but the clear thing about it is that there's nothing special about its settlement architecture. It's the kind of thing you could find through the Midlands, South Cambridgeshire, it's round houses set in a square enclosure. Um, in this case, it's trying, in this image here, it's analyzing the drainage systems, the idea of what are they trying to do with all this ditching going around the houses, going around uh, the enclosures themselves. The water is not going anywhere. It's a matter of something. There's no complex hydraulic logic at, at play here. What is interesting, particularly on this site, and this site alone, not even the neighboring one with which it's joined to, is massive amount of wetland wildlife exploitation. Literally hundreds of beavers were taken, trapped for their fur. Uh, we've got large big bird assemblage, pelicans, herons, cranes, and also lots of eggshell being dumped. So they're clearly collecting out of the local landscape en masse. And in this case, the site is here, and this is Willingham near here, this great freshwater lake that was only drained in the mid-19th century, which is probably the major source of most of this material. But we also know they're going slightly further afield, and that at this time, the Barrow cemeteries themselves would have been drowned. Um, but this model, this basically trying to model how are they using landscape in this case. Here's Haddenham 5, there's a sense of coming in in terms of various cycling, in terms of transhuman cycling of how do they learn about the landscape. But it's the fact that they're actually also using the tops of round barrows as campsites. So this is showing the barrows, uh, the rise here is one of the barrows in the Neen washes, but the sense that the barrow's sticking proud of the water level. And that's what these barrels would have been doing in basically the Iron Age. And so they're using them as, as camping stations. So to return briefly to the main body of Over, uh, what I will point out is on this map, Colnfen, which went up, is up here. Um, this is an area, this great super quarry of Hansen, where we've been working for decades now. And that a large part of it is about as much about finding out the paleo landscape, because it's this whole interface of landscape archaeology in the Fen. And as much of our time is spent trying to establish the paleo topography as the archaeology, which means it's got this enormous mapping of the paleo river systems. This is just one of the biggest paleo channels there is across the area. It's about 300 meters. It's estuarine in this case. Um, so this shows the, the mapping that's been done so far, all these various blue lines of various types of paleo channel. There are islands in the midstream, and it's on these that the barrows are, uh, the barrow cemeteries are built on. But it's this course itself, which is estuarine. Okay, so the sea was coming down there. It's, uh, you're not getting much in terms of the recognition of vegetation itself. It's because the salt water is heavier. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have much effect on the terrestrial vegetation. But the point is, it's the, during the Bronze Age, it's the backing up of the systems that are creating this island and landscape, even within the river valley itself. Okay? Now what we will just quickly look at is one aspect of these ridges, these upstanding ridges um, that were created 
as a result, I mean, they're there as a geological feature of the Pleistocene blade, braid plain, but then what has happened, as the river system backs up, the paleo channels take their courses down them again. And the one site, it's this Godwin Ridge, which again, you've seen this slide already, um, for our techniques of excavation, because one of the things we're trying to do on this project is use different digging techniques to bring out aspects of the different facets of the archaeological sequence. Now, Cash has showed the, yep, the overall sequence. Um, I won't do that here, but it's showing that on the plan that she showed, there were 35 occupation events. Only half of them have any below ground features. The rest of them are various sort of procurement camps and also involving quite a lot of fishing. So from the Middle Bronze Age onwards, we know they're fishing here quite a bit, the same way as a must farm. What is fascinating is at the end of the ridge here, we had this quite extraordinary site because it's, it's, it's late Iron Age, just going into the first decades of the Roman period. And it's this very, this ritual complex. And it's at a time when there's only about a hectare of land available at the end there. The rest would have been below water. And its settlement architecture is very modest, a roundhouse, a little ditch system. But this extraordinary platform built on the side of the river, and then all these ritual packages, three brooches found together, three weaving combs, and then all the red dots are human remains in this case. And at the base of the platform here, there have been four horses that have been slaughtered. Now these horses, there isn't on one hectare of land, there isn't enough room to graze four horses. They've been brought to the island and slaughtered. The human remains have been manipulated. They're basically cutting the long bones and throwing the, the, the heads into the waters. But the other thing that's associated with it in the platform is this enormous big bird collection. It's the same old, our old friends, the Dalmatian pelican, the swans, etc. These, these birds are being sacrificed. And that's, I alluded earlier in terms of what was going on at the, um, the shrine on the upper delts, and we had exactly the same evidence. Enormous big bird assemblages. Birds are being sacrificed at this time, and it's the whole thing about reading the entrails. That's what's important. When you make ritual, you want to read the entrails in terms of doing augury for the future. And in this case, a Dalmatian pelican is the equivalent of a sheep. You know, they're the same size. It's a big thing to sacrifice. Um, and it's quite gratifying now that the RSBP, and, and it looks like Natural England, is beginning to use our data, because we've got lot, we're finding lots of Dalmatian pelicans on these things, and they're actually now using it to support the case for the reintroduction of the Dalmatian pelican. What I will just end on, which as an archaeologist is a really gratifying thing, is Colm Fenn, just briefly to look at the same kind of issues, and that the point about this is that the use of wetland resources is very, very specific. You know, there must have been a hundred Iron Age sites dug in the Fen that at best have one beaver bone. You know, it's a sense of somebody was walking down a road and they, a pathway and a beaver died in front of them, they take it home. This kind of specialization is very, very distinct. And we don't see it very often in the archaeological record, which raises all kinds of interesting questions because it, to be able to fowl and to be able to trap is quite specialized. And how does it suddenly come up? Now, on these sites, this is quite interesting. In the Colm Fen sequence, you've got the, uh, the Cardike system here. We know that the Romans actually, we have evidence that the Romans drained the lagoon here. And it, we have two main sites. We've got Langdale Hale and the inland port at the top. So this is Langdale Hale, model Roman farm. It's clearly supplying the army. They're exploiting a, exporting animals and they're exploiting grain. The inland port site, at, um, the campground in the up at the north end, incredibly complicated site, wonderful site. The thing that's interesting about this is that though there is some evidence of fishing right the way through the Roman sequence, it's only at the final stages of this settlement, this inland port, which goes right up to the end of the Roman period, late fourth, early fifth century, and there is actually evidence of Viking occupation, that here you get this odd phase where they're actually building low platforms. The river is flooding very heavily. And again, that's when you see wetland wildlife produce being used again. You're getting otters being taken, big birds being taken. It hasn't been there in the rest of the sequence. So this, all this is just by way of saying, this sense of the, there is, seems to be archeologically, no sense of a continuum in the exploitation of marshland species. It's something that comes up at various times of very reason, but it has a long focus in terms of the ritual. Now if I can have one minute, I'll end on Ooze Wash's work. 
thought that I could get away with that. <laughs> um, just to, we've had the excavations this summer in terms of the, the project as a whole. Um, I won't deal with Fendrayton. Fendrayton is it's up on the notice boards in there. The work we did at the, uh, the bulwark have been, has been very nice. Um, Civil War Fort, I'm sure most of you know. We ended up, we surveyed it, we cored it, we geophysical surveyed it. What the work the coring showed is that it's totally dissected, the fort itself, which is a real pity. So there's no environmental preservation that left there. It's all dried out. But the two trenches we did alongside the Paleo Channel, and in terms of the volunteer excavations we've had, tremendously successful, this one. Really great. It's, it, it's the opposite shore than over. Everything you saw at over is down here, whereas here, the land is much higher on the west side. So you can see this very definite terrace edge that you get here. You don't get that on the other side of the ooze. And in this terracing here, very nice ne Neolithic site, full of work flint here. We've got a Bronze Age lynchet, lynchet in this case, developed up. And then behind it, we, and we excavated this totally hitherto unknown Middle Iron Age settlement. So very nice discovery, wonderful section. This summer, we'll be, uh, there'll be two further bodies of work one of which will be on the Maine colony, this utopian colony, mid-19th century. Tremendously important in terms of, you know, interesting in terms of utopia, if you're into utopias. Also for post-medieval archaeology, really important, because it only lasts about five years. So if you're into post-medieval archaeology, the idea of artifact assemblages that you know that only date for five years, that's great. That's really, really important. Um, the other thing that's nice about it is that the Samuel Rell Bottom, who was the founder of the Flat Earth Society, he was secretary here. We did the Flat Earth Trials earlier in the year at Denver. There are all YouTube videos available on all this, um, trying to reenact it. The other thing we will do next year is do the archaeology, the hover train, charting and plotting that, that, as you know, that it's in Railroad World Peterborough. There are partners in this case. So there's lots of opportunities to volunteer, uh, should you be so wish you can get it off the web pages or the contact the unit directly. Um, and I think I would just like to end in, in terms of sort of almost like attacking my own subject because you know, one of the things we're trying to do here is to open up, with, you know, we recognize the arc, you know, to try and reenact the flat earth trials or to do the archeology span of the hover trade. You know, it's a bit off the wall. But I think it's really important, this idea of different Fenland paths. Personally, I'm bored to death with the idea of, you know, wily Fenland marsh dwellers or people running around with webbed feet. Everybody's heard about that, whoever wants to hear about it. Whereas the idea that it's also a landscape of science, and it's been a test bed of science, largely because of its flatness and straightness. And that's why the hover train was there. That's why they did the flat earth trials. That's why meridians of the earth were attempted to be measured there. There are different signs to the story, and I think it is important that we try to embrace, at least in the pr presentation, its sense of variety, because it, it is interesting to a number of different other, different audiences. Good, so that's me.